Acts 14, verse 8. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. <clears throat> and Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. So still, God is continuing to confirm the message of the gospel with signs and wonders. Very important. Is the gospel signs and wonders? No, the gospel is a message. It's a particular uh, body of knowledge, a, a bit of information that is transmitted from one person to another. The gospel is not a vibe. It's not a feeling. Is the gospel relationship with Jesus? Is that what the gospel is? No. Relationship with Jesus does come as a result of the preaching of the gospel, but it's not the same thing. The preaching of the gospel is not um, a subjective thing. It's not something that you can entice someone to become a part of without preaching the actual objective message of the gospel. It has to be preached. Can you preach the gospel without words? No, you cannot. It is information that, that you formulate in sentences and words and paragraphs that come out of your mouth into the ears of other people. That may seem weird to you. It might seem to you that God would save everyone through some sort of osmosis, something more spiritual, a laser beam, right? Or a, just a, a washing of an ethereal spirit over you. I feel the spirit is coming over me. You're saved. No, the Bible says that a message of words, content, information, come, is supposed to come out of someone's mouth Right? And the other person hears it with their ears or reads it. Right? God um, creates worlds with his word, and he saves souls with his word preached. The Spirit rides on the, the winds of the words, so to speak. That's absolutely necessary. So you can see in modern evangelicalism and in modern evangelism, more moving towards subjective feeling and vibe, more living room and less courtroom. You can sense that in Christianity just as a whole. That's part of what it means to go liberal, honestly. That was, when I, in the 90s, this was, everybody knew the emergent church. Does anyone remember the emergent church in the 90s? Uh, Rob Bell. Remember those videos? They're just so vibey, so, so vibe. And people really in the 90s, it was more about, you were like winning people to your community through hospitality, like the evangelism of, of preaching authoritative, objective information to people that they have to rationally hear, understand, believe, and agree with, and that it might tick them off, that aspect of evangelism was thrown out the window. Um, that's what the emergent church did in the 90s. It's huge. And uh, unfortunately, most of pop evangelicalism has embraced the, cons, the teachings of the emergent church. This is especially true in college ministry, young people ministry. It's all about vibe, momentum, buzz, energy, sights and sounds, and, and no longer uh, objective, factual transmission of information. So that's one reason why our... our Worship service, for example, although the main purpose is not evangelism, what's the main purpose of a worship service? That's right, to serve the Lord and to be served by the Lord. That's right. Uh, although evangelism does take place. But our church service to new people oftentimes comes across as, they're like, it's like school, they might say. Or why is your Bible studies like school? We need less rows, more circles, right? That's the new, you know. <laughs> That's the new thing, all right? We need more vibe. We need more smiles, more polish. And, and obviously, vibe is important, and it's fine, okay? Um, who wants to go eat in a restaurant that has no vibe, right? Who here is like me? You're in a restaurant, and the food is great, and the vibe is so terrible, and you're like, I, can I help these people? Like, <laughs> don't they know, you know, there's, you could put music on. Like, I, we don't have to hear each other chewing, right? <laughs> you know, I, there's a restaurant in Arneville that I love called Myron's. Um, 
And I'm just like, man, if they could, if somebody would just tell them just a few little things, it could be great. And so, but anyway, um, I'm not saying vibe is not important. I'm just saying the evangelism is primarily the transmission of, of objective message information from a mouth to ears. And you can't get around that. You have to do that. You have to preach the gospel. How can they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a dancer? No, a, a performance, you know, a, 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 an experience that is put on by a, a team of volunteers no, how can they believe on him and whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without a preacher? It has to be spoken. And that seems foolish to us, because we know that's not how politicians are, are, are win their elections. That's not how politicians win their elections. They don't win on uh, a body of information being transmitted rationally and successfully to other people that they then have to assent to and believe and receive. How do politicians win? Fight, 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 fight. They win with vibe. They win with energy. They win with personality. And the church is doing that. The church is doing that. You can't, that's not evangelism. That's marketing. It's not how the Holy Spirit works. So I hope that, does that make sense? He's preaching. Now, um, also notice in, uh, in verse 8, I like this. This is very important. I think this is very helpful for us. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. <clears throat> he was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. Now, um, if, you, uh, if you remember um, being a part of a church as the, um, as the woke movement began to emerge, which is really sort of a kind of a 2.0 or of the emergent church, it's very similar. The emergent church and the woke church, very similar. Um, and, and there was talks about caring for the poor, right? Especially what poor? The, the push was especially you need to be caring for these particular poor people. Does anybody want to say what it is? The push was you got to go urban, got to go urban. So all the seminaries, everyone is pushing urban ministry, Mercy ministry, you're caring for poor people in the inner cities. And it was kind of like unspoken um, gospel. I mean, that was what you were supposed to be doing. Mass books and books are put out on these things. And so you're hearing things like uh, racial reconciliation, doing justice, social, uh, social justice. You're hearing all these things. And, you know, depending on how you define all those terms, I believe in all of those particular things. But I just remember being a pastor and being a minister in that phase of evangelicalism as that was picking up steam. And people were starting, like, after-school tutoring programs. They were starting uh, all sorts of inner-city, like, neighborhood ministries. I remember one particular person said they were called to do inner-city ministry, and they were wanting to get some funding from the church. And I asked them, I said, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, right now we're at the stage of being good neighbors. We're being good neighbors. We're in the city. We're with the city. We're for the city. And we're being good neighbors. And I said, you don't get paid to do that. Like, that's what we all are supposed to do. Yeah, but I'm in the inner city doing it. It's like, I don't care. Right? That does, <laughs> you, you don't get paid to be a good neighbor. That's like, well, you're a Christian. That's what you, that comes for free. That's what you're supposed to do. Right? Um, and so, but that was the vibe back then. Now, it's died off ever since COVID. I would say that, that whole vibe and that push is when... Phew, you know, it's, everyone's like done with it. And there's, we have to deal with other problems now. But the reason I bring all of that up is because going through that particular season, I can remember there was a shame for preaching the objective truth of the gospel, preaching it and especially preaching it in a way that might offend and, and you know, send people packing. What you were supposed to do is you're supposed to care for the poor and not try to convert them or win them to your church. In fact, there was sort of a shame if you, if you did try to convert them by preaching the objective gospel. There was a shame in that. You were supposed to just be friends with them for friends, not, something, not to get something out of it. And uh, I think, I, you know, at the time that seemed to make a little sense to me, but right now I think that's something I feel like the devil would say. You know, like the, wouldn't the devil, if he had to come up with a strategy for a church, be like, listen, guys, care for the poor. Isn't that good? Caring for the poor. 
care for the poor little kids in the inner cities. Do those sorts of things. Go on mission trips. But don't try to, don't try to preach your stuff at them. They're just going to feel like you're using them, like you're trying to convert them. You know, no, just be a good neighbor. Wouldn't the devil say that? I feel like that's what the devil would say because the only way someone is saved is if you preach the objective information of the gospel to them and they receive it rationally in their heart and mind and they believe. And that causes some people to be offended and causes other people to repent and believe. But there's no evangelism. And honestly, how can it even be loving if you're not doing that? Here's some water and here's some soup from our soup kitchen and here's some, some clothing for you and here's some talks on... I don't know, uh, racial reconciliation, but we're not going to preach the actual gospel to you. Okay, I feel like that is literally ministry the devil would start. I, I think I, it, if, if it resonated with me for a little while, but looking back on it, I'm glad it, we were not swept up in that too far, you know? Ugh, it's terrible. I can remember um, people would say, what are you giving out cups of cold water and uh, putting Bible verses on them? Can't you just give out cups of cold water? Uh, sure you can. Of course you can give out cups of cold water. It's not always the right time to preach the gospel, right? I don't, I don't go through the, the points of the gospel with every person I buy gas from at the gas station. Like it, there's a timing to this and a wisdom to it. But if you're going to evangelize, if you're going to reach a city like Lystra, Paul's got to speak. He's got to talk. He's got to say stuff. He's got to teach the Bible. So let me show you one more time verse 8. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and he had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. Shame on Paul. Paul would have been just totally shamed. You're over there preaching this? Care for the poor. Christians are supposed to care for the poor. we got a crippled man right here. And you're up there preaching? I mean, he would be utterly uh, shamed in today's contemporary Christianity. And what Paul would say is, yes, because I care about his soul. And, it, and hell is real. And, and the Holy Spirit uses the objective preaching of the gospel to change hearts and minds, right? Now, of course, is he also going to heal and do mercy ministry and care for the poor? Yes, amen. All of those things do what? They serve to do what? To, to I'm sorry? Yes, ultimately to glorify God. But they also serve to do what? Yeah, like uh, to what Tucker's saying, to adorn the message or validate the message, to, to demonstrate that, um, you know, the, the same way signs and wonders testify to the truth of a message, so too can acts of healing and mercy ministry and care for the poor also testify. Good works do shine. Good works shine, but, but we're not called ultimately only to, just to do like mercy ministry. We are to shine the light of good works, but we also have to preach the objective information of the gospel of Jesus Christ and risk, you know, getting run out of town, which is what happens to Paul. And uh, so what happens if you preach the, the objective gospel message and you're also caring for them and feeding them and teaching them, you know, like, I don't know, and healing and they reject the gospel? What do you think we should do at that point? I mean, you can't, I suppose you could keep trying. You're free to do that. But what does Paul do? Paul's like, I'm going to go somewhere where, the, where they will receive my free lunches. No, no, he doesn't do that. He's shameless and he has no shame about it. He goes somewhere where they will receive the message. That's the most important. If they don't want to hear it, you know, I'm going to go to somebody who does want to hear it. We're going to keep going until we find someone who wants to hear it. And focus on them. That's what Paul does. And you're going to see here in a little bit, they, they find some people that want to hear it, and they stay there for a while, continuing to teach the objective information of the gospel so that people's minds can be renewed and elders can be established and a living community can be born. Um, <clears throat> but, okay, now he's going, to, he's going to testify to the validity of his message and raise him, raise him up. So verse 10, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking, right? Now, um, let me read 9 again. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well. That's an interesting statement, right? You know, I, can, I 
maybe I'm wrong about this, but I feel like you're preaching the gospel message and you can sometimes look at someone and, and think, and you're not, I'm not Paul, so I don't have whatever Paul had, but you can tell that person doesn't have faith right now, right? <laughs> they're asleep, actually. You know, they're like literally, no, nothing's going into their head because they're asleep. Um, yeah, or there's steam coming out of their ears. I think they're, they hate me right now. I think they hate me. They want to murder me. Um, but some people's face is just like that. Um, so you can't be, you have to, you know, some people have resting Baptist face. And, uh, so <laughs> that's just a joke. But anyway, so you can't, you're like, ah, oh, do they hate me? And um, I, can, I remember talking to a family one time, and they had been coming to their church for a while. And, uh, and the mom said something like, you know, I really enjoyed the message today and this and that. And I was like, oh, okay, because I never got that vibe ever. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Okay, because I, I, I thought maybe I, you were confused or upset about it. And the whole family was like, mom, we told you. We, t- we told you. Your face looks angry. <laughs> so just, you know. But anyway, but Paul looks at him and he sees he has faith to be made well. What does he have faith in? He has to have faith in what Paul was saying in the message. Through the preaching of the message, the objective gospel that Paul was preaching and speaking on, the Holy Spirit um, gave him faith. Absolutely, the Holy Spirit comes in. That's what the sword of the Spirit is not bottles of water. The sword of the Spirit is not smiles and hospitality and being a good neighbor. That's all very important. It's the shining of the good light of good works that they might glorify God. It's a part of it. But the sword of the Spirit, the thrust of the Spirit is the, the, the stuff that gets people mad at you. It's the preaching of the objective words. Um, and, uh, and you don't get to evangelize without uh, potentially coming under threat yourself. That's just how it works. And so he had faith in that message, and so and Paul says, um, stand upright on your feet. That's amazing, right? Um, <clears throat> verse 11. By the way, this is why the academy here is for people that receive the message. It's not for everybody. All right? Um, because if they don't receive the message, then they don't get the benefits of the academy. That's just how, you know, the, there's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of, of social benefits and, uh, and, and educational benefits, cultural benefits. But if you reject the message, um, we only have so much resources and time and space, literal space. It's, that's why it's for, the, it's for the people that receive the message. And uh, as, as soon as they, it come, we come to find out they, they hate the message, then we ask them to go to a different school. Um, verse 11 and when the crowd saw what Paul had done they lifted up their voices saying in Lyconian the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men now this is interesting we have Paul speaking and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ the objective information of Jesus' life, death, burial, resurrection and ascension and lordship over all one guy has faith and believes and then Paul heals him um, as a sign to that, to that message. But then all the rest of the crowds really like, what are they all, what is everybody else into? They're into the miracle. Do they believe the message? Well, obviously not. The gods have come down to us. They obviously miss the whoo. You know, Paul's preaching the message of a God who came to earth and is in heaven now. And they're like, no, the gods have come down. So, completely missed the message, but they are very stoked about this church service. You understand what I'm saying? It's interesting, isn't it? Something in their worldview has them, they are, they are I would say they are having an experience. Or I would say, are they having a worshipful experience? Are they having a spiritual experience? All of the above, yes. But they don't get the message. And you're going to find out later they hate the message. And if you keep saying that, Paul, we're going to kill you. They, they actually do kill him, in a sense. Um, it's interesting, right? 
Hate the message. Love the performance, though. Love the performance. Love the signs and wonders. So, I mean, Paul, Paul could at this moment, he could have had a massive mega church. He really could have. And, um, and he had more than lights and pyrotechnics and uh, kick drums. Uh, he, had mir- he, could, like, raise, he could give people the ability to walk who had been crippled from birth. You know, smoke shows are one thing, like smoke and lighting and hook the cable up on your back and fly through the sky. Take it down for a notch. Take it down. Cold play, slow. Make, make it slow. Bring you down. Bring you back up. Bring up the emotions. If someone comes out on the stage, good morning, welcome to this. You know, if, as you see these cards passing around, like you could have, you could, wow. Imagine, though, if someone was crippled, walked, wow. Wow, wow, it would be like a Taylor Swift concert, <laughs> right? It would be. They would work. The gods have come down to us. This is what's happening. This is the pagan worldview. I'm, I'm trying to speak in a way in which you catch what I'm saying. This is the pagan worldview at work. Hating the message, missing the message, but enamored by the signs and wonders. And it even works if your signs and wonders are fake, you know, even if they're like the Walmart version of miracles. Yeah, even legs growing out. But I mean, just like very beautiful people with fake tans, white teeth, beautiful hair, just demonstrating before people what it looks like to be glorious, to be, to be saved, to be successful, to be worthy, to be accepted. This is what it is with the lights on me. That, you're just displaying prosperity and, and bounty and blessing. And they, and they see that I could be that. You know, and it, you could do all of these things without anyone ever resonating with the objective offense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the pagan worldview. It's just the pagan, pagan worldview. Um, <clears throat> the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Now, wow. All right, let's move on to verse 12. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Um, I mean, the, the miracles are causing the overwhelming mass of the people to draw uh, very bad conclusions, right? The miracles are. Do we want miracles? Yes. Do we want people to be healed? Yes. Do we want people to be moved? Yes. All of the above. But the only thing that actually saves someone is the, is the message that Paul was speaking. And a large percentage of the people are, are ready for the show, but they don't get the message. I think that's a big takeaway. That's a big takeaway. Um, and they go through all of this, you know, commotion the priest comes out they're offering oxen and sacrificing and all of that and um, why do they automatically go into this mode you know how do we explain beetlemania or or uh beberites be- 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 or what do you call them you know believers <coughs> what's the what's like the modern day equivalent of that swifties how, i mean how how do you explain People are at an LSU game, right? Uh, how do you explain people coming in March crowds and standing at a stage adoring someone and weeping cry, tears and, and, and women like offering their bodies to these people as sacrifices and men wanting to be like them and admiring them and, and everyone's hands are up like this often. They're like this. Wow, wow. You know, like, how do we, what is going on there? And, and then you see a, a church service and it's like, wait a second. I don't want to be a legalist here, but I'm picking up some strong similarities. I don't want to be a legalist. And, you know, and, uh, and pagans don't have everything wrong. You know, I mean, a broken clock is right twice a day. But, but there really is something, I think, going on in the, in the human heart and mind, in the worldview, that longs to, to see the performance, to see these people, to elevate people, to adore them, and to flock to them in large crowds. I th- that's, I think, what is happening. I think if we were to go back 200 years and ask 
uh, some Christian pastors to l- watch the videos of these things, they would say, oh, I know what that is. We used to, we call that blasphemy. That's what it would, that's what they would, they would say. But we just, it to us just seems natural. It seems natural. And, and now you say, well, we're not, when, when we come together in church, though, we're not worshiping those people. We're just adoring them. It's like the whole Mary, do we worship Mary <laughs> uh, argument. We're not worshiping them. They're leading us in worship. Okay, and I believe that that's probably true for a lot of people. But I, I, would, just, I would just argue that if, you're, if everything is exactly the same, okay, if the, uh, the, the way you shuffle in at the very beginning, you know what I mean? It's sort of casual. It's relaxed. You know, you, you find your seat. The way the crowd is whipped up and moved, the way the show goes up and the way the show goes down and the musicians use their skill with music to, to, do, to evoke the same experience and feeling. There's a liturgy that we're doing. We're practicing it. We're go, doing it over and over and over again. And then we go to church and that same, we're doing that same exact liturgy, the same hand gestures, the same uh, you know, swaying, the same closing the eyes. I don't, I don't know if churches, they do the uh, cell phones anymore. Do they do that? I wouldn't be surprised. And, the, and, the, and the, the performance and the, I would say that this liturgy, if you do this over a long period of time, and some of you that have never been a part of the evangelical church are looking at me like I'm crazy, but trust me, you do that over a long period of time, it shapes you, it forms you. And it, it and, and does not shape you and form you, I don't believe, in a, in a godly way. The way you worship shapes who you are and what you are becoming. And uh, this, I think, is a great example of a, of a pagan worship service. And, uh, and Paul and Barnabas certainly um, are not into it. It's also, you know, what a political rally looks like, too. Sporting events, politicians, um, athletes, musicians, American idols. And, uh, and so, we, you know, Pastor Scott and myself and, and everyone uh, in our, our worship, we're trying to be conscious of these things. We, are, we want to not be pagan. We want to be Christian. And uh, so, anyway, we got a lot to learn. Um, verse 14, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments. That's how, that's the best way to, um, to that was the highest form of protest, was to, to tear your garments. And they rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. So they hate this whole worship of man, be moved by the miracles and the performance, missing the message completely. Paul and Barnabas hate it, and they run out into the crowd to stop it. Now they could have had, they could have become cult leaders at that particular point in time. They could have had everything that Simon the sorcerer got. Um, um, but they didn't. They were genuine Christians, and they protested blasphemy, and they hated blasphemy. And they wanted to teach the people not to be blasphemers and to worship idols. And so I think we need to do the same thing. Okay, um, don't teach your children to adore stars, okay? To fawn after them and to, to like... You know, I'm not saying there isn't honor, honor due to people who have honor. Like you, you should. I, uh, President George Bush was at that game last night on TV. I don't know if y'all saw that football game. Um, and I'm, I'm not a huge George Bush fan. But if he were standing right next to me, I would, I would be attentive. I would listen to him and sh- give him honor, for honor is due. I remember the football players next to him weren't paying him any attention. He was trying to shake their hand, and they were like high-fiving each other and stuff. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? Like, there's a man of great honor right there. You should render honor. I'm not saying honor isn't due, but we can't teach our kids to adore and to worship, to look like, to dress like, to sound like, to talk like, Right? to slave after, that's all blasphemy. So um, your kid, don't teach your children to be enamored by athlete stars and um, artists and musical performers 
or politicians. We worship King Jesus. Amen. We can respect talent and we can give honor to whom honor is due, but there's a fine line between that and throwing your body and crying and weeping. I can't wait to be in their presence, but I can't be in their presence because they're back in their holy of holies, the green room where no one is allowed, where no one is allowed to, to, to be in their life-giving presence, but maybe I could come close to it. Don't let your kids be like that. And also, don't let your kids want to be that. Your kids, when you don't, your kids should not want to be an American Idol. You understand what I mean? They might like music, but they should be able to distinguish between the good gift of music and the blasphemy and idol worship that our country and our nation has turned music into. Can we just enjoy music for social benefits and for fun and for joy and art to make, to serve our community and to serve our families? Can we just enjoy it as a gift instead of worshiping musicians or wanting to be a musician that's worshiped? You know what I mean? Don't let your kids grow up. I want to be a, I want to be a football star. Why? Why do you want to be that? Is that what God's called you to? Is that how you're going to serve your community by violating the Lord's day every Sunday? Is that what you're going to do? Like, I want to be a, a rock star. Why do you want to be a star? That's not what God's called us to. I want to be adored. I want to be worshipped. Don't let your children do that. And sure, and do not send them to a school that promises to give them access and potential to be that star. I mean, that to me is mind-blowing that people send their children to atheist schools, agnostic schools, apostate schools, because they have a good sports program. What are you worshiping? I mean, how many times have I heard, I, we like CCA, we like the Christian part, but you don't have this particular athletic program. So you're going to send them to an apostate school because they have an athletic program so they can be a star and dress up like a star and have their photographs taken like a star and run out on the field and have everyone so they can pretend to be a god for a season, like a high school, high school football player? Do y'all, am I making any sense to y'all? I think, this, I think there is a lot going on here that we, we, I think we are guilty of blasphemy. And so we need, to not, uh, we need to teach our kids to play football, but not all of the idol worship, right? I love football. Um, play football. It's, it's great for a lot, of, a lot of reasons. But don't long in your heart to be adored by man and to worship by man. And don't worship man. Worship God alone. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Throughout throughout the Bible, the word "star" is another is it's a god. It's a little god, an angel, uh, something to be worshipped. Um, and they protested it, and I'm protesting it, and I hope you'll protest it with me. We don't, we don't, we want because I promise you, if you do that, they're not gonna. It's not gonna make them love sports and music. Sports and music just becomes a means to a, an idolatrous end. It's actually going to destroy the very joy of, of music and sports that could be there as a gift from God. Um, um, let's just finish up this section. Paul goes on to tell them, he says, No, we're men like you. Um, we're of like nature with you, and we bring you good news. He's got the message. He goes back to the message. We're bringing you, we got a message here for you. If everyone could quiet down now, I have to say some things that you're going to need to hear and believe, right? Turn the lights up a little. Turn the music down a little. I have a, I have a boring message to tell you. It's good news, right? That you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Repent, right? Now he goes on to explain who God is. They're a little bit, they're not ready for the Romans road, um, right? Right? <laughs> You know, when I are, they're not, you know, back in the day, you could knock on doors and say, hey, if you were to die today, would you, do you, would you go to heaven or hell? They're not ready for that yet. They're like, don't even know what you're talking about. They don't know God. What do you mean? I, you're God. No. <laughs> so he has, he has to, he has to start with like just basic worldview stuff, the worldview of, of creation, linear time. Uh, he goes through all of these various things, he, and that's just the beginning of him trying to teach them. And, um, and you know, and the, and the people receive it to some ex- extent, but in verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Oh, man. But then verse 19, here comes the, uh, the church crowd. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. 
supposing that he was dead. So there you have it, right? Um, they're worshiping him one minute, and then they're stoning him the next. So clearly don't get the message, clearly don't have faith. And I don't know if Paul is dead. I don't know, but I love the way it, it says this next verse. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. <laughs> Whoa, wow, right? Hope the crowds didn't get to see that part, you know. But he's like stoned, he's laying there dead, and all the disciples come around him, and I assume they like pray for him, and he just gets up and he's like, let's go back to the city. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. All right, well, that's good enough for today. Uh, y'all have a great Lord's Day.